The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. This is a hard teaching. And so many of them left. I've left church at least once in my life, maybe twice, twice. They came very close together. The first time was after I'd gotten married and the chapel, chaplain at Florida State left and went somewhere else. Well, I really loved Lex. But Sundays were busy. John and I were both still in school trying to be, you know, busy with jobs and with, with schoolwork. And he was finishing the semester and what was he gonna do after that and all this stuff. And so we just kind of slid out the door. And then he went to law school and I went to work. And so Sundays were the day that I did laundry and at least played at cleaning house. Never really did it very well, not my thing. And so we just kind of didn't slide back in the door even though there was a new chaplain. And then we moved to Buffalo, New York, south of Buffalo, New York. And the first Sunday we were there, the rector was gone and the curate had the service. He was just a little bit stuffy. She said, trying not to be too critical. And after church, I shook hands with him at the door and he looked at me and said, I don't believe I've seen you here before. So I said, well, yes, we just moved in about three blocks away. You know, we're brand new to the area. And he said, oh, we did not slide back in the door. <laughs> Until about a year and a half later when I was working as a literacy volunteer and one of my friends happened to be a member of the church, of an Episcopal church up uh, above the city, east of the city. And she said, do you know that curate's not there anymore? I said, oh. So we wandered back in and stayed. And when we moved to New Orleans, we looked at a couple churches and when we found the church we stayed at, we stayed. And then of course I went to seminary and there was no more sliding out the door, <laughs> even on days when I might've wanted to. It is so easy to leave. It is so easy to get our backs up, to get our minds twisted around something and just go, well, I just can't do this. Out we go. The first time I encountered somebody who, did, who told me he didn't believe in God was when we moved to Buffalo and I was having, we had people over for dinner and uh, the husband, we, I don't know how we got talking about it. We started talking about church. And the husband of the couple said he was an elder in the Presbyterian church. And I said, that was really neat and how great to be involved in the church. He said, oh, yes, but I don't believe in God. What? He said, yes, he said, I don't believe in God. I haven't believed in God since my mother died. And I said, really? He said, yes, because if there was a God, he wouldn't have let her die like that. Hmm. I have heard that same sentiment expressed many times. Once from one of my sisters who left for a long time and from lots of other people, even those like this person who stayed in church, but slid out the door. Things are hard. Life is hard. It's really not always hard, but it's still hard. And the teachings of Jesus, particularly in this chapter from John about eating my flesh and drinking my blood, and what are you going to do when you see the Son of Man rise up to the heavens from which he came, all of this stuff is just like, you know, it, it well, it gives your brain whiplash after a while. You just kind of can't, you have to keep going like this and just, oh, it's, what, who? This week I read it. At, essay in the New York Times by a, an author that I, I read frequently. I don't always agree with him. He's a conservative Republican. Uh, but he writes a lot about religion. 
And that this particular article he wrote was about how you can think your way back in. And so I had to read it because I don't think you can think your way back in. <laughs> we can think about being back in, but it takes more than the brain to know that we're back in or to become back in. It takes the heart, it takes prayer, it takes other people showing us the experience that they have had of the God who loves us all. Jesus turned to the other disciples and said, are you gonna to leave too? And Peter says, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We, have, we know and have come to believe that you are the Holy One of God. The gospeler does not use the word holy to refer to anybody but the Son of God, the Messiah, the Christ. This is a much more eloquent confession than Peter gets in any of the synoptic gospels, but it's the same, the same confession, the same realization. And yet even Peter will say, I do not know this man. Even Peter, who can express so beautifully faith in Jesus, belief that he is the son of God, will deny him when, when he's taken up to be crucified. Judas will do it sooner than that, and Jesus knows that. He sort of alludes to it in the end of this reading. There will always be times in our lives when we either A, feel that God has left us, or B, we will want to leave God. Or C, we will discover we already did. Getting back in, coming back in the door, takes more than our mind, takes more than our just saying, it's time I went back to church. It's time I found a community in which I can worship. It takes doing it. And it takes that community's acknowledging that you are there and surrounding you with the love of God. It doesn't just happen when you walk in that door because there's somebody that's gonna look down their nose and say, I don't believe we've seen you before. And you're not gonna come back. And after that's happened in one or two churches or they've done a service that you don't like or they said things and you thought, what the heck is that? Where did that come from? I've always liked the Episcopal church. I should just stay there. Or I've never liked the Episcopal church. I'm never going back. We have to listen for the word of God, the word that symbolically sits in that book on our altar, the word that resides right here, the words that we read every Sunday from one of the four gospels. It doesn't really matter which one as long as we keep reading those words and hopefully the words that we read outside of church. We are to follow the word of God the way, the truth, and the life, and the word, capital W, of God. Jesus teaches us how to do that, but unless we pay attention to the lowercase words that we have in scripture, we won't exactly know how to do that. And so we'll think that what we're doing is just fine. There have been several challenges this week in the news. The first one, of course, is the fall of Kabul, Kabul, whichever way you want to pronounce it, and the mass chaos in the Exodus. Now, I don't care how you feel about any of that. There are people on both sides of the issue, people who think we should have stayed militarily, people who think it was time to go, people who think we should have planned this better, people who realize that or think that we couldn't have planned it any better, so it just happened. But there are people there, people just like you and me, who are terrified. It is up to us to make sure they know that God has not abandoned them. How do we do that? Well, in the Episcopal Church, we have a really huge way to do that. It's called Episcopal Migration Ministries. 
It's been around for a long time. It's one of the, the principal arms for, for settling immigrants in this country, has been for years and years. It's a well-established organization and yet not all dioceses have an EMM office. I don't know whether this one does or not. Couldn't find that out. So I wrote a check. Actually, I said, just take this out of my checking account every month. That's one thing we can do. But as immigrants, as refugees come into this country, they're gonna need places to stay. They're going to need people to welcome them. They're gonna need homes, homes and schools and jobs. And just maybe, we can help with that. Just maybe through prayer and discernment, we can determine whether this congregation can support a family or an individual who desperately needs somebody to surround them with love. I don't know. I can't answer that for you. I have trouble sometimes answering it for me. So I do what I can in a house where I cannot really add anybody else and I write a check so that somebody else can do the work. I've seen incredible things happen through Episcopal Migration Ministries. Families who had nowhere to go suddenly not only have a place to go, but they have people to help them fill out the paperwork, find the jobs, get their kids in school, get their medical needs taken care of, and just help them go to the grocery store. Jesus tells us to do all those things. Jesus helps us figure out how we're supposed to do that. Although I'm pretty sure that if you read every one of the gospels from cover to cover, you won't find Jesus saying exactly, now here's what you need to do. First, and then, and oh, by the way, Jesus doesn't work that way. Jesus gives us the words we need to grow, and to discern how we're supposed to be him in this world. This is a hard teaching. This is not something we can just go, right, okay, I'll start that Monday morning at 7.45 and I'll just stick to it until it gets done. One of the other things I read this week was a new book that's out that contains sort of little vignettes, little pieces of, of, of uh, conversation that the editor had with John Lewis before he died. I think, I cannot remember the title. I, I'm terrible about titles. But the introduction was written by Andrew Young, who knew John Lewis, of course, from the beginning of the whole civil rights movement. And he said, one thing you need to understand about John is that he was always focused on what he was supposed to do. And it didn't matter whether anybody else understood that, was going with him, he was going there. That was where he was going. It was his call to go the way he was supposed to go. And nothing swayed him from that. Not beatings, not prison, not losing an election, nothing moved him from that focus for his life. All too many of us get all the way through life not really sure we ever had a focus, not really sure what it was or whether it was always the same focus and maybe it wasn't. But as long as the Christ is at the center of the focus we believe our life is supposed to have, the way we are supposed to go, then it will happen, even though sometimes it looks like it was a disaster. We learn from our failures, brothers and sisters. We don't always succeed. I don't know if you've found that out yet. <laughs> An awful lot of us have. But we keep on going. We keep moving in the direction that God is calling us to move because this is a hard teaching and we cannot do it without God. Jesus invites us into his life. 
His life was just so much more than our lives, but as we knew him as a man had the same beginning we have and had a very awful, disastrous end that too many people have, always exper have also experienced. God was there at the incarnation. God was there at the crucifixion. God is there in the ascension. God is always there, even when we might not be able to tell. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you read to the end of that psalm, you will hear the same psalmist saying, I will teach your ways to others. I will praise your name. Even when we feel abandoned, we are not abandoned. Even when we're sure God can't possibly, possibly care about what's happening to little old me, God cares. And how do we know that? Because you all care. Because God is moving us in community to care not just for ourselves, but for others, even if they're not of this community. This is a hard teaching. Do not walk away, brothers and sisters. Stay the course. Put on that armor that Paul talks about. Know that when you say something that you know is right and people beat you down for it, metaphorically or really, that you are still right. That you are still with Jesus. And that as you are being spurned, so is the Christ. This is a hard teaching but we are strong enough to make it through.